today, um, I want to read from one of my favorite, um, well, not necessarily my favorite, but a book that's uh, really been interesting to me for quite some time now. I actually got it at a animal rights conference, I believe it was in D.C. in 2015 or 14. But anyway, it's called Gods and Chains by Rhea Ghosh. Uh, and it is about the treatment of uh, elephants specifically, and specifically in India. Um, and as you can see on the cover, it has the foot of an elephant um, enchained. Um, and I just saw, even just from the title alone, when I saw it, um, how touching and uh, cool to understand that, you know, by the title, the author was already coming from this place of seeing divinity um, in its, you know, omnipresent nature that it is, even in uh, animals, um, and particularly in such a majestic and uh, large animal, right? like uh, one of the largest, I believe, if not the largest land mammal, land animal, um, the elephant. Um, and this book isn't just a condemnation alone, I think. I think it is an attempt um, to understand the history and the context of the usage of elephants by humans in India, uh, and you know, and what that means today, and the state of things today, um, and so it's pretty nuanced, and it was a very fascinating and cool read uh, book to go through. So, um, oh, and I'll read right from the back a little bit to tell you about what the book's intentions were offhand. Right, this book hopes to highlight the conditions of captive elephants as they are currently used and kept in India. Revered, revered and loved by all sections of the populace, the Indian elephant occupies a very special place in people's hearts. And so there's a few other things there, but to move things along, I'll read um, a few expert excerpts and pieces from the book that I found particularly um, uplifting uh, and fascinating. So it opens up with a photo of um, the Thrissur Puram, uh, it's an annual festival held in Kerala. The annual festival at Thrissur Puram in Kerala is a dazzling sight to behold. Thirty elephants, richly caparisoned, parade down the streets to, delight, to the delights of lots of people. The elephants look stunning, graceful, and majestic, yet problems exist. Few people know what goes on behind the scenes with captive elephants in Asia. They see elephants as festivals, decorated with beautiful body paint and gold ornaments, and believe that the life of the elephant is as luxurious and impressive as the finery would suggest. This assumption is rarely the case. One of the most important things to keep in mind when assessing the status of elephants in captivity is that they are not domestic animals. Unlike cows or horses, they have never been selectively bred to live in close association with humans. A veterinarian describes them at best as, at best, tamed wild animals. They are intrinsically unsuited for captivity, no matter how well they are taken care of. This said, however, some of the most glaring problems regarding the keeping of elephants in captivity have solutions and if addressed, would at least minimize the stress and suffering of the animals. So I think that's a great, great opening. Um, and interesting to note that unlike sometimes um, when often talking about animal cruelty and the treatment of humans and animals, it's kind of just almost straight degradation a lot of the times and miscare as we use animals for uh, food, uh, particularly one of the biggest usage, usages. I think it's interesting to come from this perspective of an animal that's used in religious uh, uh, festivals or explicitly is really a living religious right not just a sacrifice but you know um, and is is um, in some respects right at least abstractly adored right if you look at the uh, embodiment often the depictions of Ganesh is depicted as a human headed um, I'm sorry an elephant headed deity um, and the reverence people have for Ganesh and the Ganeshology and the deepness of that um, yet in practice and in the reality, out of the abstract, you know, that which is, you know, it also goes with the title, right? Ganesh, which is viewed as a deity, an emanation of God, God-like, um, but in reality, in this human world on earth, in that same place where they refer to and see the depiction of an elephant as a god, they're enchained and enslaved and forced to participate in rituals that uh, humans made up, you know, and usually not in the best conditions, as it opened up to say. Um, also, one thing that struck me in that pack passage was the um, the idea that the elephants are not uh, intrinsically not domestic animals, right? And it said like 
They have not been, unlike cows and horses, they have never been selectively bred to live in close association with humans. That sentence alone, right, the idea that any animals or any beings have been selectively bred <laughs> for easier, you know, uh, interaction with humans, you know, for any reason they didn't choose, is chilling in and of itself, right? Um, and and shouldn't go unchallenged, right? They did, you know, well, why don't we selectively breed them then? Or why are we selectively breeding any animals? Uh, to live in close association with us, or why are we interfering with their breeding process? Um, and is that right? You know, the things to be questioned. I think you know, not an automatic assumption. This is a story about about this photo here. It's a little excerpt. Uh, it's titled "Maddening Solitude." Uh, it was written uh, July 6, 1996, in the Deccan Herald in Bangalore. Moti. 14-year-old elephant stands forlornly under a tree, enduring the maddening delirium of his must condition. He is noticeably disturbed and keeps shaking his head to and fro, secreting fluid from his face. He was left behind by the Russian jumbo circus two months ago as being in heat, could turn him violent. Moti played cricket in the circus when he performed here, but now he stands chained to a tree, steeped in misery and the agony of his condition. He has a mahout elephant caretaker to look after him who gives him food and water, and also some native medicine to soothe his condition. However, members of Compassion Unlimited Plus Action, CUPA, I'll say CUPA, are indignant over the fact that elephants like Muti should be forced to live out unnaturally and cruelly stunted lives in a circus, which takes no account of their health needs, such as his present condition. Moti's Mahout says in defense of the animal's owners, that if a shed had been built over Moti to protect him from the elements, he would, have, he would have become even more truculent and unmanageable. However, it was chilling to see the cruel spikes and iron thorns which his mahout brandish, and how they visibly cowed Moti. Beside the chains on all his four feet made it impossible for him to reach the water offered to him in a tiny bucket. His great body strained cruelly to get the water. Ultimately, who can really tell except Moti how an elephant feels under the sun and the rains far from his friends in the forest, waiting out a demented time. Moti played cricket in the circus when he performed here, but now he stands chained to a tree, steeped in misery and the agony of his condition. He has a mahout elephant caretaker to look after him, who gives him food and water, and also some native medicine to soothe his condition. Another little powerful uh, set of stories that was kind of Put out there. The following account by Peter Jaggi illustrates the power of their memory as well as their emotion. In Kerala, a mahout opens a coconut by crashing it down on the skull of his elephant. This is an incredibly cruel act considering how hard a coconut shell is. Many years go by until by chance one of these big brown nuts is lying within reach of the trunk of the very same elephant. The torturer of that time is standing next to the animal. The elephant picks up the nut high in the air and crashes it down onto the head of the mahout. The elephant bull, the Ruvambadi to Vishnu, pierces its mahout with its tusk and literally tramples him into the ground. When another mahout puts a cloth over the corpse, the elephant heads for the covered body and pierces it again. The mahouts of Kerala know many such stories. The elephant guide Sathya Palan at Gurruvayor tells a touching one. Often during a temple celebration, people try to molest our elephants by, for instance, grabbing the trunk. When we try to keep them from doing it, the molesters sometimes attack us. Mrs. Thayepalan says that he knows of animals that help their mahouts out by grabbing them with their trunk and lifting them onto their back. Once we sit on top of the elephant, we squeeze a certain spot behind the ear with our foot. The elephant starts trumpeting terribly and people run off. Mrs. Thayepalan knows another pleasant story. While swimming in the big pond of Guru Vayur temple, a colleague once fell off the back of a female elephant. The cow then pushed him very gently to the shore and thus saved him from drowning. The mahout was a non-swimmer. That was exactly how they found Girija Prasad, alias Manikantan, a 15-year-old tusker. The inspectors learned that the elephant had escaped two or three times from its prison in the middle of the city. Though potentially endangering many human lives, Girija Prasad's escape Attempts, escape attempts were not without a cause.
The poor animal had over 60 wounds on his trunk and pus oozing down his legs from the tight metal chains that held him for nearly 22 hours of the day. He was completely immobile and alone, surrounded by the noise, crowds, and pollution of an urban area radically unlike his natural home. He stood in an open courtyard under the scorching Indian sun, without access to water, squealing as his mahouts beat him in an attempt to teach him how to bow. This situation has to be his life for the next 50 or so years. Elephants have always been a part of Asian tradition. In India, in particular, the practice of Gaja Puja and the usage of elephants for carrying men and materials have continued for centuries. However, sadly, the circumstances in which the pachyderms were kept earlier and the socioeconomic conditions today are vastly different. Earlier, elephants were treated as members of a family. Mahouts stayed with their charges throughout their lives and passed on the love and expertise of handling to their children. Things are very different today. Costs have increased, surroundings have changed, and even the climate is changing. Therefore, there is need for change in conditions of captivity as well. The human beings surrounding the animal are in an ever-increasing cir circle. Mahouts, owners, veterinarians, lawmakers, forest departments, NGOs, media, public, all have an undeniable role to play in the processes of the three R's, reduction, refinement, and replacement in the present commercial use and abuse of this magnificent animal. Given the Indian public's deep love and reverence for the elephant, there is no reason why changes should not take place. And she goes on to give a few examples. Anyway, I highly recommend the book. Check it out. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy. Cheers.